okay, right? And 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 just about how many? So ev- just about everyone is pre-hospital treatment, right? I mean management. Okay, how many docs do we have? We have uh, we have Jeffrey there in the back, okay, and Sean. And uh, okay, so let me ask the next question: How many of here uh, have are certified in PALS, Pediatric Advanced Life Support? Okay, um, everyone's BLS, right? And then ACLS, most uh, most people. Okay, just so I can target the audience, how many of you have seen a baby or, or a kid less than five C's have a seizure? Seizure. Okay. How many of you have not seen a baby less than five C's? Okay, we have. Right, okay, fair enough. How many of you know someone who's an epileptic relatively closely? Right? Okay, some. All right, today what I want to do for the next hour and a half is look at the pre hospital management of individuals with seizures and things that look like seizures. Now, status epilepticus, a seizure that lasts five minutes, or a seizure that starts, then stops, then starts, is considered status epilepticus. So, and we know that if you have status epilepticus, more than about five minutes. Ooh. Is that better? Okay. Thanks. Oh. So we know if you have a seizure that lasts more than five minutes, it's got a 61% chance of going more than an hour. However, the vast majority of seizures don't last five minutes. Now, I, uh, my father's an epileptic, and I grew up with watching him seize frequently. And he would go to uh, his organizations that he goes to with, with, for support for epileptics, and if you had a room, if all of us in this room had seizure disorder, most of us would have a sign around our neck that said the following, <clears throat> if you call the ambulance, <coughs> you pay for it. Now let's think this through for a minute. You call the ambulance, you pay for it. And the reason why is many epileptics seize relatively frequently. They might seize twice a month. And somebody, well-meaning, calls an ambulance. The ambulance comes. They wake up in the ambulance, and the first thing they say is, oh, crap, somebody called an ambulance. Are you kidding me? See? And it gets very expensive, if you can imagine, especially if you have to pay for the ambulance in a place where we have to pay for an ambulance. So on one hand, you have a whole population out there that sees this on a regular basis. On the other hand, status epilepticus is a very dangerous illness. In other words, if you go ahead and seize more than five minutes straight, particularly more than 30 minutes, that was the old definition, your mortality rate is very high. And I have some, if we get to the slides, I can actually read the exact percentage. So what do we need to do? This is a tough thing for the pre-hospital management, right? We have to decide when it's uh, my, my cousin Joe's having his typical seizure because he didn't take his seizure medicine. When, do we want to transport that guy? Or do we have a baby with meningitis or grandpa with a stroke who's now seizing and we have to save his life? So in the next bit, if we can get this going, <laughs> at least an hour, I have an hour of videos. And we're going to watch baby seize. We can watch people have syncopal seizures. We can look at these things so we get a feel for them. Because really, as you know, you can do your BLS protocols, your ACLS protocols, but till you actually see these babies in adult seizing, it can be difficult. And I do, do, do hope this works. And in fact, I even got a hot spot just to make sure it, because I thought the problem would be the internet. I didn't realize the projector would be the major issue. But I have every confidence in our audiovisual people. All right, now, before we talk about I do, I do. They are inspiring companies. They are. Sure. Now, before we move on to the pre-hospital management of, uh, and, and, and looking at these videos, what I want to do is spend a minute and look what the Maryland guidelines say for the treatment of status epilepticus. In other words, uh, Dr. Sago was nice enough to refer me to the website, and I looked at the the 544-page document that, that paramedics, a, the BLS and ALS use for the out-of-hospital management of 
yay, of change of metal status, and under that change of metal status, if it's uh, in the table of contents, is alter metal status slash seizure. Now, what does what is our protocol? In other words, right now, if you get on a Delta unit and you go to someone's house, what does the state of Maryland say you're supposed to do? Let's go through that step by step first, because that's really what we're talking about first, because you have to follow the protocol, right? And then we can go ahead and then step back from that and use our judgment, looking at videos, the, the kind of judgment that every police officer or EMS person has to go ahead and work with. Hey, we got some slides. This is very exciting. So, so since I got this far, let me just make sure we know. First of all, BLS. When you arrive on the scene and someone is seizing, click. You need to see if it's lasted five minutes. Most seizures don't last five minutes. And by the time you get in the truck, get to the house, walk in and see the baby, the chance of that being less than five minutes is pretty small unless you're real good. So if you're that good, fine. But if you're not, how long has this baby been seizing? Now, if the baby or, or a person is still seizing in five minutes, what are you going to do? Of course, you're going to do your airway, breathing, and circulation. ABCs, monitors. Right off the bat, ABC, monitor. Make sure the babies see if the baby really does respond or doesn't respond because the movements can be weird. We'll show, we'll show you the videos in a minute. Then what are you going to do? Make sure the baby's breathing, right? You know to do this. This is basic BLS. You're going to make sure they have a pulse, just like you have for BLS. And guess what? If you didn't have a pulse, you're going to start with your BLS, and you'll do, you'll do your chest compressions, just like you do for anybody, right? But the baby is breathing, right? And the baby does have a pulse, yes, and he's making these abnormal movements. Now what? Now, when you look at your basic life support, what are we going to say? We're going to say, does the patient or the baby have the neurologic ability to breathe on their own, right? That's the next thing, because our mind is controlling the circulation and the respirations. That's what it's doing, right? So you look at the kid. Is he breathing? Airway, breathing, circulation, things we know to do. Then we do disability, right? Now, as soon as we get past the BLS, what are we going to do? We're going to do a glucose, right? Because now we're thinking, why is this baby or, or adult seizing? Right off the bat, we do a glucose, just like we're, you know, and then, so this is once we get to ALS level, we're going to check a glucose, right? And make sure that glucose is fine. If indeed the person is an, a diabetic, they're diabetic, even at BLS level, right? And you know they haven't, and, and, and they're seizing, you can go ahead and give them some glucose paste under their tongue, right, between their teeth, you know, their lip, right? You know, this is like you would do for anybody who's hyperglycemic. Because that would be the number one reason, a, a very basic reason that we don't want to miss for somebody seizing. All right, it's up, but we're almost done with this part, right? So step by step, you, you come, you say, has it been five minutes? Yes, you do airway, breathing, circulation, just like you do anywhere. You do monitors, just like for basic life support. You see, do I need to start the heart? Do I need to do BLS? Then you say, does this person have a low sugar? Do I need to put, do I need to give them sugar? Then what am I going to, then you're going to step back. Is the person seizing? Now we're going to have cukes for helping us. If it's been over five minutes, then what does the protocol do? The protocol says we need to give a medicine, right? And what is that medicine? It is midazolam IM. IM. Less than eight years in the leg. For a baby, in the leg, right? Um, and I've often thought for protocol, you know, actually I was over at uh, Children's Hospital in, um, D.C. this weekend, I was talking to the, the life flight medics, and I said, how do you go give your IM midazolam? Because then I was talking here tonight. And they said, oh, we give it in the leg. I said, well, what age do you start giving it in the arm? She goes, they go, I always give it in the leg. And I go, well, let me get this straight. You got a 12-year-old girl, you pulled her pants down and put it in her leg? You know, really? You know, it's babies, right? And the 12-year-olds are probably going by ground or something. So above eight, we can put it in the deltoid. We're going to use midazolam. Now, when you approach, when you go in the house, they may say, look, oh, my baby seizes, or my baby's been having febrile seizures. I have this rectal diazepam, and this is what we give. The protocol says, state of Maryland, says that you can, as an EMS provider, assist the placement of that rectal diazepam. So realistically, in your toolkit, at ALS level, what do we do? Every breathing circulation monitors, check a glucose. Make sure it's okay. What's next? You're going to give them midazolam. It's so easy. If they're too big and inappropriate to pull the pants down to put the midazolam in the thigh, I am. 
you're going to put it in the arm. I am. We'll talk about the doses. Now, if this doesn't work, you're not going to call. You're going to call the ER. The ER is going to tell you. And you'll say, look, this patient's still seizing. What do I do next? They're going to say, give more. <laughs> That's what they're going to do. And you're going to transport, making sure the kid's safe, the adult's safe. And you'll, while you're doing that, of course, you'll check your disability and your events. You're going to make sure that there's no evidence of trauma. Make sure to see if you have to stabilize their neck, do all the right things you do. The family members, you're going to do your sample history, right? You're going to look for allergies and medicines and past medical history, last meal, and events around this. Did the baby fall from a table, right? Or did the stepdad beat the baby up, right? All the things we know to do. So when we package the patient, whoops, so we're we'll going to start in a second. So when we package the patient, when we go to the emergency department, we can have our vital signs, we have our what drugs we've given, and we have a good enough history so that we can then the, make the ER proud of us, right? <laughs> so that way we look good. Now, this is what the state of Maryland, according to the guide, says is what we need to do as EMS providers to try to stop status epilepticus and make sure that uh, our citizens are safe and taken care of, okay? Now this is the, m I could probably go now, right? This is what it says. But the problem is things aren't that easy, are they? Like I just said, I mean, someone's seizing, how do you know, you know, gosh, uh, when you bring them in, when don't you? So what I want to do for the next bit is we're going to go through a series of videos. And I want to show you what seizures look like. And if I can get this to work, I'll be happy. And uh, because I'm not that uh, clever with the videos. Okay, so first thing, uh, my name is John Dunford. Uh, I'm a doc, and we're talking about seizure management pre-hospital. Okay, whoops, and I gotta figure out how to advance. Oh, can you put the next slide? <laughs> how, do we, how do we do it, how do we do it? This way? No, that way, at the button. Uh. All right, you do it for me. Okay, now look it. Now, can you, uh, can you click that link there for me? Just click that. And I want you to watch this, this, this video for a minute. Click, click. Okay, this is our first video. This is a 14-month-old. Okay, now let's see. We get called to see this 14-month-old. Click, click, click. Give it a chance. Come on. It works great on my computer. It did, it did. Is it, if it clicks, it should link. All right, so now let's talk about what a, a normal seizure looks like, what this 14-month-old is supposed to look like. Now, what is a seizure? A seizure is a short-circuiting short in your brain. Okay, let's just think of it that way. Is it, um, oh, Lord, gosh. Can you click, click it? Okay, it's a, it's a short circuit, right? And, and how I think about it is your brain is like a big circuit breaker box. You guys see a circuit breaker box? And imagine some electrical tape. So, sorry, if the circuit breaker box has too much current going through it and you get a short circuit and all of a sudden you get a fire in your circuit breaker box. What happens is that th if that thing is firing, you move. Now, let's go look at what a typical seizure is going to look like because since I can't show you, I'm going to demonstrate it to you, okay? What's going to happen? The seizure most of the time starts in one part of my mind and spreads. So what's going to happen? First, my eyes are going to go to one direction. They're going to go this way. And what's happened? My other side of my brain is going to drive it to the left. Then what's going to happen? This arm is going to move out. This one will contract, and I'm going to look like I'm fencing. See, like this. My eyes will be back. And then I will shake. Now notice something. Notice that I'm not going like this. I'm not arching my back. I am fencing. And the movement is not suppressible. I know I look ridiculous. I probably look ridiculous. But the point is, if you move me, I will keep going. As opposed to a tremor, let's say uh, I withdraw from, from my, my I, don't, I don't get my heroin. Okay, I'm withdrawing. I got a tremor. You can suppress that. You go into the house, you push the, push the arm back or hold it, it'll stop. It'll start again. Stop. Start. That's not a seizure. That's a seizure. Once you have that, sometimes it's associated with, sometimes it's associated with a, with a cry. <laughs> right, right. It's associated with a cry. So here's. Oh, Lord. Um, 
It works on my computer. Is that my computer? It just, I, I wish. Now, what's going to happen? The first part of my dystonic movement, the fencing movement, during that, right about at the end, my whole body is going to contract, and I will make out a cry, uh, like that. In the hospital, if you're on the neurology ward, you'll hear down the end a, uh, and you're like, oh, someone's seizing. You walk around the corner, and <laughs> someone's seizing it away. Right. But the cry is af it takes a, it's a little bit after the start of the seizure. If someone goes, ah, they're probably putting you on. Okay? And then you have the clonic phase. And that will last usually for less than a minute. Now let me tell you a story. When I was a, I'm a neurologist and an anesthesiologist, and when I first started neurology, I was so proud of myself because here I was an intern, and one of the patients on our ward started seizing. He was a seizure patient. Oh, I was so good. I got an IV in, and I gave some Valium at the time, and I stopped that seizure, and I felt so proud. And I walked out, and I talked to my and I go, oh, I stopped Mrs. Smith's seizure. And he looks at me and he goes, why <laughs> did you do that? She seizes all the time. Oh, and it deflated me a little, all right? But nevertheless, um, this is the same approach that you're going to use, right, to, to, to stop the seizure. So again, wait a minute, two, three, four, five. And what does the state of Maryland say you're going to do? Okay, there we go. Right, let's start finally. Let's start with this baby. Can you start that? Okay. Now look at the, and also I want you to listen to the family too, okay? Now again, they're worried about febrile seizure, so they're going to check his temperature. Now look at him. Clonic jerks. Imagine if you're this baby's parents. Very stressful, right? Look how calm they are. It's very good, isn't it? Now he's going to start to stop. Now you notice they haven't called an ambulance, right? They comfort the child. Now he stops seizing. Okay, that is a febrile seizure. We're going to stop that video. How many of you remember one in t uh, uh, as many as 20%, as many as one in five? parents have had a child or, or, or children have had a febrile seizure at some point. How many of you have had a, your child look like this? Right, there's a few. Okay, right. Now you're going to come in, they're going to call an ambulance and you're going to zoom in right then. You'll take the temperature, you look at airway breathing circulation, check the baby's vital signs. The parents will be truly scared. Temperatures they said was 38 something, right? And um, if it's the first one, you're probably going to bring them in, or else they'll bring them in. But I just want you to see what a typical febrile seizure looks like. Let's go to the next one. Can you click that? I want to show you what an a, a adult epileptic looks like uh, under a monitor. We can get this going. All you do is you click on that. Just click on that blue thing. Just click. It should the link. It should hyperlink. Just click on it. Perfect. Yeah, that's how you do it. Just click it. We tried doing that. Okay. All right. Now I want to. This is a. Can you? Okay. Now I, we may have to scoot along on this video just a little bit. This is a, a lady. Okay. Now she is in, in an epilepsy epilepsy ward, and she has a video EEG, and they're trying to capture a seizure. Okay. 
Can you move ahead a little bit? Okay. Right. And there we go. See, this, see what I said? The fencing posture. Okay. Now look at how stressed the nurse is. Doesn't look too stressed, does she? Like uh, another seizure, same day. It's alarming looking, isn't it? So she takes his glasses off. Now you, if you were there, will be timing this, won't you? You want to make sure it doesn't last over five minutes. They put him on her on her side, so if she vomits, it won't. She won't ask for it. And now it resolves. Now let's look at the third one. I'm going to go, and then we'll, we'll, we'll continue on. So what do we saw? A febrile seizure in a baby. We saw a generalized tonic-clonic seizure. But you can imagine that girl, if she was at the 7-Eleven, she could happen in 7-Eleven. And this, this, this lady seizes regular, regularly, especially if she forgets to take her anti-epileptic drugs. And we're going to look at the third one. Now this one I think is probably the, one of the more important ones. So I really want you to listen to what's going on in the background on this one. Listen. Listen. Let's just stop. stop, stop. Now, I really want to look at this, this, this seizure for a minute. It's very violent, isn't it? Uh, if you looked, if you... And, and remember, they called 911, and then if you heard that carefully, oh, can we, can we send it back? Do you notice that? Oh, we're calling 911, call it, then, oh, no, send it back. I can't send it back, you know. So meanwhile, 911's going to show up, and right, you get the idea. In other words, but this is very alarming. I mean, it, 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 it doesn't sound like he's breathing. It sounds like he... Remember they used to say these guys would swallow their tongue? It looked like he could swallow it. They don't swallow their tongue. And in fact, we don't even, and, and, and you don't stick anything in their mouth, right? You just make sure they're safe and let them go. 
and then you time that. Now, let's imagine you actually came and he's still seizing. Five minutes, you're going to get him, you're going to give him some versa. You're going to give him a dazzlam in his arm. Or you're going to try to stop that. But nevertheless, the vast majority of the time, they do stop. But you're going to think, every breathing circulation, at no time, this kid really wasn't breathing enough to stay alive. Now, you have to make that judgment. But also, look at the interaction. The, the, the friend is like, no, 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 don't call. If he was all by himself, the friend would be like, oh, yeah, this is easy. I got the video. Like, yeah, I got the video. Well, that's great. High five, you know. I finally saw myself seize. Oh, that's violent. But the friends are like, oh, this is terrible. You know, and they can't help but not call 911. And so, uh, right, and this is our dilemma. You know, how do we allocate resources properly? And as an emergency provider, I think we have to be aware of what typical epilepsy looks like and how scary it really is. Because for most of us, it's beyond our human existence. We don't see people seize regularly. All right, let's move to the next slide. Can I go to the next slide? Oh, I forgot what the next one is. Let's see. It's, it's, uh, oh, do I need to push something? Uh, just push uh, here, down here, bottom. No, uh, get out of it. Out, 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 out. If you look at the arrows. Oh, tell you what, we'll play that. Yeah, that, that slide's good. Play it. That's good. I want to watch. Now, I want. Okay, this is our next one. One more slide. Okay, let's watch this video. So just click on that and voila. Okay. Now I want you to. Can you fast forward the first? I want you to fast forward about the first 10 seconds on this, okay? And, okay, and that's good. That's good. If you bend down on your knees and hyperventilate for a minute or so, and then quickly stand up and valsalva as you stand, you will think about it. No, you're going to see. Watch this. Normal German medical students, syncopizing away. There he goes. Take it a little longer than usual. There you go. I want you to watch on each of these patients what their movements are like. So he's shaking. That's the these are normal people that reliably accompany somebody who has transient ischemia to their cerebral cortex, or it may be the basal ganglia. We're not really sure. So she twitches a little bit. Those are fine examples. But you say, I can tell the difference. Well, you tell me if you can tell the difference between this guy. Watch this. Watch these movements. If you're seeing this yourself in the emergency department, I would argue this would be difficult to distinguish from a generalized tonic-clonic seizure, let alone if we're asking these patients' family members who are freaked out. Watch her. She's my I mean, this is a normal person. This is you. You can do this, too, tonight. In your hotel room, wherever All right. you want to let's, uh, let's stop that. But please. All right. So that is syncope. Now, if you, caught, if you didn't catch the very beginning, you, you could do this at home if you really wanted. Don't. But uh, you're gonna, you squat down. You hyperventilate. Stand up quick. Woo, you will faint. And you'll fall back. Boom. Like a lump of coal. And then you'll have some myoclonic jerks. You're going to seize. Now, where, I work in a hospital, right, and as a neurologist, where am I going to, in any hospital, where do you think they have the most seizures? In phlebotomy. All these people come in and get their blood drawn. They're like, oh, they faint, but they don't lay down, they don't sit down. Oh, blood rushes from their head and whoop, 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 whoop. they have some monoclonic jerks. It's a, still a seizure, right? But it's not epileptic, it's epileptic but, but the etiology, the cause is not enough blood going to the head. Right? They fainted. And look at every medical, all those medical students. So again, oh, let's call 911 because someone's in a dentist chair, right? And what happens, they're hyperventilating, you know, and they stand up, oh, boom, boom. You can have some shakes. This is going to stop on its own, though. Why? You just lay them down. I actually had this happen. I'm going to tell a little aside. I was actually on an airplane, and I was in the middle seat. And the two front seats in front of me, the people kind of went back like this, you know, and I could almost touch the lady's ear, and she looked really pale. You know, you look, it's like, oh, man, she looks pale. It's like, oh, no, she's going to faint. Yep. She, <laughs> and she's going back, and I literally, I could touch her, right? And then, sure enough, just like this, whoop, 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 she's got a few, she sees it. See? I'm like, okay, lay her down, lay her down, lay her down. Well, meanwhile, you know, that doctor, is there a doctor? And I'm looking, she's right there. And I go, I'm looking at her. Okay, she's still okay. I see that. You know, she's not dying. She stops. <laughs> Someone will lay her down quick. And it's weird. When I was like a medical student, is there a doctor? I'd always volunteer. Now that I've been doing this for lots of years, I'm like, oh, I hope there's some junior medic or someone wants to go. 
so I'm sitting there like waiting. I think she, I know she's fine, but now if I don't raise my hand, they're going to think I'm a poop head. You know what I mean? Because I'm out here. So sure enough, this young internist zooms over and says, oh, oh, I, I'm a doctor. I can help. And she starts looking with the, with the flight attendant for like a band. Like, oh, do well. I wonder, she tries to do a history, really. It's like, okay, I wonder if she has hypoglycemia and she has allergies. And so meanwhile, this is a true story, right after her, about five seconds later, one, two, three, four, this guy shows up, older, white hair, struts over and says, enough, like that deep voice, <laughs> enough. And then, very condescending, really, you know, looks, gets her up, he looks at the lady, the, the patient, and says, you two, to the two the people sitting in the seats next to the lady that sees, stand up, you got to stand up. Went to the flight attendant, let me help, lay her down, lay her down. I go, oh, thank goodness, they laid her down, that's the right thing. And so, the t and then <laughs> this fellow with the white hair goes <clears throat> to the flight attendant, you need to find someplace else for these, uh, a very bold voice, you need to find someone else for these two, a uh, place for these people, these ladies to sit, because this lady needs to lay down. Oh, thank you. And of course, then the patient feels much better. Right? Just like those syncopal seizures just felt much, those medical students felt better when they laid them down on the mat, right? Then she felt better and a little queasy. And then you know what the gray-haired guy goes? He goes, you know, I just stopped this flight from deviating to a different city. You really owe me. Really loud, deep voice, in front of everybody. And the flight again goes, oh, well, thank you. That's such a nice thing you did. He goes, I want a free ticket. <laughs> oh, you want a free ticket? And then he goes, well, are you a doctor? He said, I'm a surgeon. And he said, it's a true story. He said, I'm a surgeon. So anyway, I, I, everybody thought, well, okay, you're not the nicest fellow in the world, but you did do the right thing, see? And I kind of felt bad because I should have just laid her down myself, but I probably used a different approach. Okay, so <laughs> now let's talk then. Uh, well, the first, th so now we know what a baby looks like with a febrile seizure, right? We saw that. So we're not alarmed when we see it in the future. Now we also know what a generalized tonic-clonic feels like when that, you can imagine this lady, that when there was this in telemetry, goes home and forgets to take her medicines and now she's at the 7-Eleven and falls down. Tell me that's not going to give people a scare, right? And lastly, you stand up quick from your hot tub. Oh, <laughs> you can get syncopal or you're getting your blood drawn. Or you know the common one is in OB, the poor dads that are watching that epidural go in. Oh, oh. They're done, you know what I mean? They just, oh, faint. They've had that happen too. All right, so let's face it. When we go ahead and see someone seizing, right, we're going to think, okay, we're going to check that sugar, which we just talked about. We're going to think air, we breathing, circulation. Do they, what's their sugar level in the glucose? But the next thing is, what is causing them to seize? And what are the two most important things? No blood going to their head or no oxygen in the blood, right? So if they're not breathing, and there's no blood pressure to their head, you can go ahead and seize from that. So right off the bat, what am I, number one and number two, am I breathing? I know is there adequate blood pressure? You know, are we in shock? And is there adequate oxygen? Are they breathing? Right off the bat, you can tell that because you can imagine your neurons won't be happy if they don't have either one of those two things, right? Then you're gonna think, what else could cause this brain to short circuit besides not enough blood and not enough oxygen? Well, right off the bat, a fever in a kid, you know, fever went up very high, you got a fever. Meningitis, an infection. Something in the head, this very short list, there's really only four. Something in the head, a stroke or a tumor. In old people, adults, adults don't seize that often if they don't have seizure disorder. So if I'm over 60 and I've seized, I've had a stroke most likely, or I have a brain tumor. Now, it's like something going on. Now, your threshold for bringing that patient in is very low. I mean, you've got to bring them in. They need a CAT scan, because something's going on. Either there's not enough oxygen going in or not enough blood going in. You know, something wrong with their heart or they have a brain tumor, or they've had a stroke. You need a CAT scan. So something structural in the head that you can CAT scan to look at. Check and make sure the sugar's not low. And then the last thing is drugs. Are they an alcoholic? You know, a true alcoholic that drinks and drinks and drinks all the time. You cut that alcohol away about nine, nine hours, and they're gonna seize on you, because alcohol's a depressant. They're like, oh, could be, that's still season again, because it didn't have alcohol, right? So again, that's the set, drugs. So the big three, are structurally, besides oxygen and blood going into the head, is drugs. If, they, if they're seizures patients, they didn't take their drugs. Or let's face it, you're an alcoholic and you pull that drug, the alcohol away, they can go ahead and seize. Next, they get something in their head that they got, you got to get a CAT scan for, a stroke, right? Uh, or a tumor. Or lastly, um, you're going to go ahead, so drugs, tumor, and you're checking that glucose, making sure that's okay. Big picture, easy, easy. Air breathing circulation monitors, 
right? ABC disability and uh, the ABCDE again, as you know to do from your EMS. You do your sample history, and you can think, why is this brain seizing? And those are the simple. That's a simple little list, isn't it? All right, let's go to our next slide. We'll go a few more minutes, and we'll take a break. Can we go to the next slide? Click the bottom. Uh, bottom. There's a little arrow. Bottom left. All right. So let's talk for the next couple of minutes. We're going to talk about five more minutes, uh, five to eight minutes, and then we'll take a little break. Okay? Because we, we got another hour after this. Is that, is that okay? And, and first of all, what do we said? A seizure is a, a fit. It's a brief episode of abnormal excessive synchronous neuronal activity in the brain. And when you actually look at the brain, this is the EEG, that abnormal, that, that you can imagine that big movement there is the problem uh, that in the head that's causing the seizure. Next slide. Can you give the next slide? All right. Status epilepticus. What is our definition? We need to know this because this is what the state will say. And our, and our, um, when we look at our protocols, it's five minutes of seizing, it used to be 30, five minutes of seizing, or two seizures that, that stop and start. And this is why that kid with the green suit shirt, he goes, okay, call 911, because he was looking carefully for a stop and a start and a stop. But really, that was just one seizure, and the guy was just kind of coming around. Okay? Um, next. All right. Morbidity and mortality are high. If you seize more than five minutes, now it's a whole different ball of worms. Right? The morbidity and mortality is very high if you continue to seize. 61% of seizures that last five minutes will last 60. Most common cause, patient forgot to take anti-epileptic drugs. Okay, next one. Between 50,000 and 150,000 Americans each year have status epilepticus, with the mortality less than 3% in children, but 30% in adults. 3% in children, 3%. So what does this mean? If you seize as an adult, and you continue to seize, and you go to someone's house, and there's Granny seizing, she's never seized before, there is a 3 out of 10 chance that she's going to die sometime in this hospitalization. That's a true emergency. Okay? You're going you're gonna, to you get an intravenous access, you're going to start midazolam, and you're going to transport. Okay? While you do A, B, C, then monitors, A, B, C, D, E, and then your ant full history. Um, Proprial and timely therapy of status epilepticus reduces associated morbidity and mortality, and this is where you come in. You can generally save lives. All right, next. Since the majority of seizures are brief, and once a seizure lasts, uh, and once a seizure lasts more than five minutes, it is likely to be prolonged. Again, five minutes is our key. Now, you get your stopwatch, you check in five minutes. Next. All right, now. I want to, this is a little bit of a busy slide, but I want to go a little bit more into epilepsy itself just so we have some understanding of some of the seizures we're going to watch in the next hour. First of all, if I have epilepsy already, what can happen? I have a little short circuit in one segment of my brain. That little short circuit can fire, and what can happen if it's on my, the, vis, the, the thing that makes my eyes move, just my eyes are going to move, and I'm going to go, oh boy, what's happening to me? My eyes are moving. Or the part of my brain that controls my arm will go, oh, my left arm is moving. And in fact, you can get status epilepticus, just focal. It's called um, uh, focal status epilepticus. And just one arm, or epilepsy, ep epilepsy partialis continuous, was really called. But just this arm will go, and it'll be like, oh my goodness, what's happening to my arm? It's going like this. It's pretty rare, but it's kind of weird. But they're a, they're a, they can talk to you, okay? Now, let's say that little short circuit spreads far enough to the other side, and they lose consciousness. Now they don't talk to you. Now they're out. They may not even fall to the ground, but they're kind of, they have automatisms. We're going to see, we're going to see videos of that in the next hour. And they kind of chew, they look, kind of look funny, and they kind of look at you a little weird. And they stand up, and they do weird things. That's co focal complex. Okay, in other words, or focal with impaired awareness. Now, it might spread all over, and then they had that generalized tonic-clonic seizure, which we saw that lady do in the neurology clinic. Okay? So imagine, though, anatomically, one spot, one's in focal, Focal with decreased awareness means it spreads out enough so you're unconscious or just not in there anymore. Hello. And then lastly, you get the generalized tonic clinic. Now, this is in stark contest, contrast to a, a seizure that is of generalized onset. And what does this mean? We're going to see a picture, we're going to see a video of this in the next hour of a kid with absence. How many of you know someone who has a kid or with absence seizures? Right? What happens to these kids is their whole brain fires at once, see, 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 and stops. And they're like, what happened? I didn't notice a thing. See, 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 see. They might get a little couple jerks. And they'll keep going. See, see, see. They might do this 50 times a day. Runs in families. Uh, it's, it's absence. 
Right, it, it, absence is the word. So you can call it absent-minded, but I'm absent-minded and I don't have seizures. But <laughs> absence, right? That's the term, uh, the medical term, right? Absence. Um, and that's a very different thing. The whole brain starts and stops and starts and stops. And I took care of a, a young girl today with scoliosis. She got her whole rods and screws placed in her back. And as an anesthesiologist, we did that. And I measured her EEG throughout the case, but she actually has history of absence. So we used a drug called Keppra to take care of that. But, but either way, that's... So, look, so do we have then. And when you go and you say, oh, when the mom says, oh, she's got a history of seizures. Oh, but she has absence, absence. Okay, that's, that, that's the one that turns on and off and on and off and on and off. But usually then isn't that big a deal, you know, as opposed to focal with some decreased awareness that the focal <laughs> spreads and the generalized tonic clonic it really spreads. Absence comes and goes, comes and goes, comes and goes. And guess what? When they pop out of it, they're not even tired. I go, I'm good. Totally different. The whole, when you look at the EEG, the whole EEG fires at once, stops, starts, stops, and they can do this dozens of times a day, and their mom could have the same problem. They wouldn't even know. All right, so that's our little classification of patients, that, people that already have epilepsy. Let's look at the next slide. All right, now this, let's reinforce this for a minute from Netter. Now, the most common place that you can have a short circuit in your brain to cause you to seize is an area called the mesial temporal lobe, which is the middle part of the temporal lobe of your brain and it's got a little short circuit there, and it spreads out, right? And you'll have these symptoms, and you can see sometimes you'll just kind of gaze off a little, it'll be focal, stim, stim, stim. Then it'll spread out, you get a partial focal with loss of awareness. Like sometimes your anti-epileptic drugs will kind of catch it, and you'll just kind of feel a little weird and kind of walk around a little stunned. And sometimes, oh my goodness, you'll fall, shake, 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 shake. Okay, you get the idea. Like my visual aids, I'm animated. All right, next one. Next slide. This is that absence I just told you about. Look at this EEG. The whole brain fires on, fires off, fires on, fires off. And they could do this many times a day. Now you can imagine what, it, uh, and sometimes they're very quick and your child is having learning difficulties because they're missing 30% of what they're taught at school. Why? Because on, off, on, off, like nobody knows, right? Next slide. All right, now just a little brief thing about uh, uh, the status epilepticus. It is possible to have non-convulsive status epilepticus. In other words, you don't actually, after a while, your muscles just wear out. So you're still seizing. So let's say after an hour, your brain's still seizing, but you'll just stop. But my brain's tired, my body's tired, but my brain's still seizing. Let's say you don't, let's say you take an oral hypoglycemic and you're away from home on vacation, you know, you're on, let's say you have diabetes, and you take a glipizide, and you take a little more glipizide, and you don't eat, and now your sugar goes really low, and you go unconscious. You're in your hotel room and you seize and you continue to seize and no one knows. Someone walks in about 40 minutes, they're not going to actually see moving anymore. But their brain is still seizing, right? Because they're in non-convulsive status. It's still seizing, but their brain, the body's like, hey, I'm done. Coffee break. Because I've already, I don't have any, more, I, don't know, I, can't, uh, I can't seize anymore. All right, next. All right, so again, what did we say? When you go to see a baby or an adult or anybody that calls you to take care of them, you can think. Are they seizing or not? Okay, they are. Has it lasted over five minutes? Yes or no. Do they have a history of epilepsy? Yes or no. Hmm. Is it a febrile seizure? So common in kids, yes or no. But then when can you think, what is going on that I need to know to save the kid's life? I need to know, are they oxygenating? In other words, are they breathing? <gasps> can I get oxygen to the brain? Uh, um, so that's hypoxia. Syncope means I don't have enough blood going to the head, just like that lady in the plane. You know, off she went. You know, or that poor dad watching his wife get an epidural. You know what I mean? Syncope. Next, are their sugars low? Okay, so we're going to think: Is there something wrong? So the brain's not getting enough sugar to keep itself happy, right? And then what do we think? What's going on in the head? Is the head damaged, like from a head injury? Is there a stroke in there? Is there a tumor in there? Your x-ray vision looks in the skull and says something's going around in there structurally. Next, you're going to think, do we have an infection? Infection, right? Do we have meningitis? That's life-threatening. They need antibiotics right now. On your PALS algorithm or your ACLS, this is sepsis. You're going to be giving antibiotics sooner rather than later, especially if you have a long transport. You might give it before you even transport. Drugs, absolutely. Cocaine, absolutely. You know, um, amphetamines can cause you to seize. Also related to drugs, remember ecstasy can drop your serum sodium. So you get hyponatremic. So you get a hyponatremic seizure. In other words, there's some electrolyte abnormality that's making it so your unha brain's unhappy, so it's seizing. So we have dr electrolytes, drugs, fever, head injury, syncope, hypoxia, and hypoglycemia. Next slide. 
All right. So let's stop there. Now that we've fixed our audiovisual, so you can stretch your legs for a minute, get you, get going, so you guys can uh, get out of here. This is such a nice facility too. I, I feel underdressed. You know, Jeffrey mm -hmm. said, "I'll oh, be really casual." Of course, he's wearing a tie. And look at me, you know. Um, <laughs> I never wear a tie. Right. I anticipated a much more swarthy bunch of people uh, than you all. You're very, you know, much less swarthy. So I figured I probably should be less swarthy myself. But there it is. All right, let's move on. And, and so what we're going to do now is I want to watch, I want to show you a few more videos just so you can see some different kinds of seizures. And then we're going to go through the specific Maryland guidelines and I'm actually going to show you the book, the picture of the book and the three pages that you have to know because this is what the EMS guidelines are. Uh, so let's go ahead and watch this first video for a minute. All right, let's click it. No, no, not, um, do we see this? Hi, yes, sir. Okay. Hi. What are we here to do today? It's going to take him a second. Blow, 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 blow. We might have to move along in the bottom a little bit. He's close. Stops moving. So close. He's like, I haven't seen it yet. It's working so hard. There he goes. Tyler. Tyler. Now, he's immediately back, right? Now he's going to do it again. Tyler. Tyler. Second seizure. See, he's like nothing happened. His whole brain ceased. Okay, let's stop. That's the end of the video. So we asked about absent seizures. These are the kind of start and stop and start and stop and start and stop. That's what I was just telling you about, that kind of seizure. There is an absent status, pretty rare, but just so we know that that's what this is. Let's look at the next video. Um, we already did this one, so we'll go to the next one. Okay, can you go to the, click the bottom one? Now I want to see, by the way, this is... If you, my, my dad is an epileptic, and this is what my white. dad looks like. Okay. And the white. And the white. Now, if you look at her, remember, this is parse focal with change in mentation I was telling you about, right? She doesn't fall onto the ground. She has an automatism of oral facial buckle movement. It's just like she's chewing. Comes around. If you didn't know, she, you think she... Uh -huh. There you go. Okay, let's stop there. So that is partial complex. So partial, remember, starts in one space, and that your hand chooses... And then there's, it used to be called partial complex, now it's called focal with change in mental status, right? So what's happening is one part of her brain, that mesial temporal lobe most likely is seizing, it spreads around and she loses consciousness. She has oral facial buckle movements, very common. Their eyes move off to the side, but these automatisms can be very complex. And there was a fellow in my dad's epilepsy group, his automatism, no kidding, is to pull his pants down in public and pee. Okay, and you can imagine, he's like me and you, giving a, he's a very high-functioning guy, and all of a sudden he's sitting there peeing right in front of you. You know, and then of course you'd be ashamed of that and he would never come back, you know what I mean? So it can be, these, sometimes these, these automatisms can be very complex. Okay, next, uh, yeah. Question. On the video you, you just showed, I think the third bullet said that she had these, and she had like gastric bypass surgery. How many, how many of these occasions are genetic or that sort of thing versus induced by something. Well, something that's like a that. very good point. It's a whole different talk. For the most part, we can anticipate that this lady most likely has a structural problem somewhere. The question is where, you know, and, and, and why. 
Now, she had bypass surgery, okay. In other words, as part of the bypass surgery, could she have had a stroke? Right? And she stroked, and now because of that stroke, there's a segment of her brain that doesn't have good insulation and likes to, to the short circuit. You know what I mean? So there's, all, there's different etiologies, and it's beyond, way beyond our EMS protocol. But again, if you look at her, what are we going to think? Let's say we could call to see her. You're going to think, okay, airway, breathing, circulation, okay, monitors, put her on the monitors, see what her pulse ox is, all the rest. Then you think ABC, check his sugar if he needed to, knows is she, is she okay. Then you're going to look at her, talk to dad, and do your ample history, as you know to do. Allergies, medicines, past medical history, last meal, and events. You go, oh, shoot, she didn't, he says, she does this all the time, and she didn't take her anti-epileptic drug, versus she's never done this before, really. Or, she's a diabetic, I need to give her some sugar, okay? Then you're going to think, okay, is there a structural problem, stroke, seizure, tumor, okay? Uh, does she have meningitis, an infection? We just talked about that. Uh, does she have a very high temperature, fever, meningitis? And is there a drug issue? In other words, is she an alcoholic and didn't take her drug, her, her alcohol, right? Say, that's to live. Fine. Or next to? No, no, no. You can pass that. Bypass that. Go to the next line. Okay. I want to point out one more febrile seizure. And I think we're, then we'll go to our diet. Hey, what are you doing? <laughs> listen, to the, listen to the mom. Very violent. <laughs> Now I'd probably lay this baby down, you know. Okay, let's go ahead and stop. By the way, the editorials behind this are interesting. If you actually read under the YouTube, all, a lot, uh, we're, we're, we're done with that. We'll go to the next slide. The thing about it, if you looked at, at what you showed, throw the, showed this to a thousand people, this kid seizing, you know, at least, like, I'm going to guess from just looking non scientifically, 60% of the people that comment on this think that dad was a total jerk. Like, you're fine, you're fine. And meanwhile, they're identifying with the mom who's going, oh my gosh, oh my gosh. You know, uh, that's grandpa probably. And then really what's happening is mom is trying to console, the, the dad is trying to console the mom of the kid, right? Because he knows that this is a febrile seizure, these things happen, we're chilled, this has probably happened before, right? His mom is freaking out, you know, and in most people who see this, they're going to freak out. <laughs> you know? They're going to call 911, you know? And so it's interesting how the general population sees that video, totally empathized with mom. All right. Let's go to the next one. So we saw an absence, we saw another febrile seizure, and this is one of the most common seizures you're going to see is febrile seizures. <laughs> that baby is going to come to the emergency department, and they're going to go, okay, uh, here's some Tylenol. <laughs> uh, what the? All right, watch him, and they're going to send him home. All right. All right, so let's, now, I do want to spend a minute on faking. Okay, faking is too strong a word. Okay, I'm not going to say it like that. But I will say this, if I was in prison, <laughs> and I wanted to get out of prison and go to the infirmatory, I could tell all I'm going to do, I'm going to fake a seizure, because I'll be really good at it. You know what I mean? I'll be good at you. Because it can be very alarming, and I can at least get out. You know, they won't know. Uh, so we want to spend a minute, and we have one or, uh, one or two slides on movements that aren't seizures, that look like it. And, they, they, and, and I want to reinforce the fact they're very real to the persons that are actually having these movements. But they're not organic. It's psychological. Okay? Now, the topic is somatic, somatic symptom disorders. This is how a doc would go ahead and describe all of these. And these are all the kind of things that, that are kind of, they're psychological, but they're very real to you if you have them. Uh, for example, pain symptoms, diffuse pain, there's reproductive organ symptoms, gastrointestinal symptoms, then there's pseudoneurological symptoms uh, for amnesia, loss of voice, but seizures. We're going to talk about that. Difficulty walking, cardiopulmonary symptoms, palpitations, other things. But we're going to zoom in on uh, uh, these pseudoneurological spells. Okay, in other words, these are non-epileptic, but they sure look it. Let's go to the next thing. All right, there's a couple things that, there, there are ways of describing whether something's kind of real or not, but let me just reinforce just a couple things. 
if both arms are moving and you're talking, you're not seizing. There's rare exceptions. So you go see someone, what's happening to me? You're like, what's happening to me? And then you can go, well, we'll just wait for the police to get here and they can take care of you, right? Okay, so again, there are certain things you can do to kind of tell the difference. Okay, next. Next slide. All right, now I want to show you this video to see what a non-real seizure looks like. Okay, this is a training video. Go ahead and click it. Okay, I'm going to have to have you move along with it uh, for a second, just to kind of cruise along. Uh, keep going, keep going, keep going, keep going. Right about there. Let's see what happens. Okay, this is a training video. I'll show you on what to do for a spell in this British school, okay? There's these children in the background, and this is the teacher, okay? Can you scoot along just a little bit? So now they're practicing. Look at this girl at the back left. Okay, look what happened. Okay, look at this. Boom, down she goes. Now look at that. That's a fake seizure, okay? First of all, it's not fake. It might be real to her, but it's... Now look at her. She's looking up, straight up. Her hands are going boom, 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 very high frequency. Of course, it's a training video. Look at her. You know, it's a training video, but... So now, of course, what does this teacher do? teacher gets a stopwatch. Okay, this is what your an EMS in Britain are trained to look for when they look at a spell. So he's timing it. Less than five minutes. One, one thousand, two, one thousand, three, one thousand, four, one thousand. Now it stops. How convenient. Ooh, fifteen seconds. She makes sure that she's breathing, right? Airy breathing circulation. If she's any doubt, she checks glucose. And she puts her the, the kid in the safe position, so in case she is nauseated, she won't, and she tries to get her attention. All right, so that's not a real one. You can see the difference with non-real ones? Okay, keep going. Next, uh, uh, next, next uh, uh, slide, please. Um, okay, now, so let's go ahead then and look at what the EMS says that you're supposed to know about this topic uh, for, to be good paramedics. Next. Okay, go back. Now, if you look at that, your, your manual, you look in the table of contents, you'll see there's an altered mental status, and in page 46, there's altered mental status, unresponsive person. See that? This is what's in your manual. Next. Now, this is a busy slide. We're going to skip it. This is where, this is the national standard, the guideline by which all doctors have to use to treat status epilepticus. Okay, this is the evidence-based guideline, guideline, treatment of convulsive status epilepticus in children and adults, Report Society, Committee of the American Epilepsy Society. Okay, this is what the national standard is, and we're going to look at the Maryland standard and see how they pulled out from the national standard what we need to do. About three slides on this. Next. There's this very busy algorithm. Okay, but let's digest it for a minute. Next slide. First, what do they say you do? This is the national standard for the whole country. One, stabilize patient, area beneath circulation, disability. Disability means check of sugar, right? And neurologic exam. Okay, are you all right? Are they conscious? Next, time the seizure. Click. Uh, no, 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 sorry. Back. Uh, we need that. Next, you're going to time the seizure, monitoring vital signs. Assess oxygenation. Give oxygen, nasal cannula. Consider intubation. Respiratory assistance needed. In other words, but just make sure that their airway is okay. That's good. Good. BLS, right? Uh, initiate EKG if you have it. So it's, you're going to monitor the patient. Check a finger, uh, a glucose. Do you need to give glucose? And if they're an alcoholic, you're going to give some thiamine, which we all know to do, and then try to get IV access. Next. So what's next? You're going to give a benzodiazepine, all right, to stop the seizure. You're going to give midazolam, lorazepam, or diazepam. Now, you're going to look. You have in your truck, ALS caught trucks, in, according to the list that I saw for everybody on their truck, if you're ALS, has midazolam and diazepam, those two drugs. All right, now let's say those don't work. If I'm in the hospital and it doesn't work, what are we going to do? We're going to go ahead and give some next set of drugs. Next slide. Um, the, the things you're not going to do. Okay, we're going to use phosphenatoin, valproate, Keppra. Uh, there's, that's our whole next step uh, that doctors in the emergency department are going to give to stop the seizure. And if that doesn't work, next. We're going to do general anesthetic. And Dr. Sagal and I, they're anesthesiologists. If I come and someone's seizing, and Dr. Barenhouse too there, I have to give him credit. Yeah, <laughs> he's one too. Right. Um, I, yeah, yeah, right, right, right. Uh, 
what I'm going to do is uh, I'm going to sit and the patient seizing. I have this powerful drug called propofol that Michael Jackson likes. You know, I can bolus that in, stop the seizure, bag mass ventilate, and watch them come up. And a lot of times I can just stop the seizure myself in about three or four minutes with that drug. And so they don't have to get intubated, and I've just saved someone $50,000 because they don't have to go to the ICU. Okay, but it's a way of general anesthetic. But that's when you take care of someone, that's the next steps that's going to happen. But for the pre-hospital environment, what do you have? You have midazolam and diazepam. Those are your, your benzodiazepines. Next. All right, so this is what we just talked about. One more thing. If a pregnant woman seizes, we have to always think about eclampsia, and you're going to get magnesium with that. And they comment about make sure if they're magnesium toxic, you can give some calcium. Magnesium, they get very weak. If you give too much, you'll have to give some calcium. All right, next. Oh, avoid flumazenil. All right. Now, this might be a little bit on your pay grade, but this one drug, it's, it's the benzodiazepine reversal. And in some EMS pro programs, they actually have that because someone took too much Valium. You could use the flumazenil to try to get them back. The problem is it will cause non-convulsive status or, or convulsive status. You'll be in status for days with that stuff, I've seen. So every neuro unit shouldn't have flumazenil even around. It, it, it's that's be, maybe beyond our group, but just something to think about. Okay, next. All right, so let's look at the protocol step by step. Next. Okay, number one, uh, here's your EMS protocol. To be able to drug, do doses, you need to know how much to give, right? We're going to talk about the midazolam and the diazepam, but from a practical standpoint, really, it takes a lot of guts to go actually stick the drug in somebody. It's one thing to talk about, is actually do it. If you don't do it very often, it's gutsy. All right, so let's, first of all, you need to know how much kids weigh, how much people weigh. And I'm going to simplify this. Basically, one-year-olds weigh 10 kilos, five-year-olds weigh 20 kilos, okay, just... And uh, uh, here they say they weigh, yeah, 20 kilos. So one-year-olds weigh 10, five-year-olds weigh 20, three-year-olds weigh 15 kilos, okay? Just memorize it from ever and ever and ever. One-year-old, how old's your baby? One. Oh, they weigh 10 kilos. I, I suggest this. Five-year-old, oh, 20 kilos. Now, they might be a, you know, uh, a 23-kilo five-year-old, which is a chunk, you know. But still, for our purposes, for saving a life, that's enough. One-year-olds weigh 10, five-year-olds weigh 20, three-year-olds weigh 15, okay, kilos. Now, that's just the way it is. But you need these because all your drug doses for kids are in kilos. So you've got to know that. And it's scary. You show up, oh my gosh, how many kilos is that? I don't have any kids. I don't even know. And I think in pounds. I mean, it's 22 pounds, 25 pounds. One-year-olds weigh 10 kilos. Five-year-olds weigh 20 kilos. Three-year-olds weigh 15 kilos. Okay, simple. Next. All right, now this is your table. Of, uh, this is what's in your kit. According to the, I haven't been on your Delta units, but in ALS unit, this is what you have. And if you look, you have diazepam, magnesium, and mid-ass. Next. This is what the midazolam looks like. This is the bottle. Uh, there's a five milligram per five ml, okay, and then there's a two milligram per two ml. Okay, this is what your midazolam looks like. You know? Now remember, most of the time you're gonna be giving five milligrams. Okay, most of the time, five milligrams. So for most, any, except for a little kid. So five milligrams, that's five milligrams, and you're gonna be giving five mls of this stuff. Right, and I have to see what you guys have in the truck, but it's pretty good volume, yeah. right? We'll talk about how to give it in a second, yes? Now, the rectal diazepam, I don't know if you guys have this on the truck, I, I, but nevertheless, when you go to someone's house, you can help mom give this stuff. So I just want you to know you're aware of it and you can look, at, you can look to make sure, because it's on your, you have a dosing regimen for it on your protocol. And it is okay by protocol, from what I read, for you to take care, to give this stuff. Next. Okay, next. Okay, now this is it. So let's read it line by line. It's three pages, you know. But this is, this is your, you know, when, when, the doctors are written in order, and this is what's in your purview to do, step by step. Number one, initiate in general patient care. Okay, you cause such as epilepsy, hypoxia, hypoglycemia, hypoperfusion, head injury, CVA, alcohol, or drug. We've all talked about that, right? Um, consider a recent history of possible illness, infection, fever, or stiff neck, meningitis. We just talked about that, right? Okay, we're thinking, what is wrong? Why are they seizing? Next. Do not attempt to force a device into the patient's mouth if the patient is still seizing. We talked about that. Don't do that. You're just going to break their teeth. You're not going to help them any. They're not going to swallow their tongue. They might bite it, but they're not going to swallow it. Next. So, treatment, BLS. If the patient is still seizing, do not restrain. Protect the patient from further injury. Consider cause of seizure activity. Again, why are they seizing? When seizure has, activity has stopped, identify and treat injuries. If patient is a known diabetic, glucose paste, 10 to 15 grams, should be administered between the gum and cheek. Consider single additional dose of glucose paste if not approved. We talked about that. All right, that's BLS. 
as any BLS person can do, according to from my reading of uh, from what I understand. Now let's go up to ALS. Okay, next. You, now your ALS is going to check a sugar. I'm going to check a sugar and see where it is. Consider midazolam. The patient has no IV or IO in place. Administer midazolam five milligrams intranasally or IM. How easy is that to squirt it in their nose or to stick it in their deltoid if they're an adult or in their kid in the, in the leg? Okay, but, but this is an adult side, right? So you're going to give five milligrams in the arm. You can think it in your mind. I checked my glucose. <coughs> They're still seizing. It's been five minutes. E even without the glucose, I'm giving five milligrams in the arm. And, you can, and you're going to save a life with five milligrams in the arm. How easy is that? Right? How great. You don't have to put an IV in even anymore. It's fantastic. Right? Um, <coughs> however, if you, if you put the IV in, right? If you stop your truck, wait, put your IV in, you know, um, uh, administer midazolam 5 milligrams IM or uh, uh, probably uh, 0.1 milligrams per kilo or 2 milligram increments. A slow IV push over 1 to 2 minutes uh, with a maximum of 5. So what does that mean for an adult? Basically, you're going to take the same 5 that you would have stuck in the arm and you give it slow and see if it stops easy <laughs> through your IV. I can do that. Right? So let's, what's the pharmacology so far? You take the midazolam, you stick it in the arm, but if you don't stick it in the arm, you stick it in the IV slow because maybe we won't need it all. That's easy. Right? I can handle that. Now, if you're old, you give less. And they, the protocol says if they're over 70, uh, give 50% less, okay? Because uh, they don't, because it might be, they, they, patients may be extra sensitive to the midazolam. Next, if unavailable, five milligrams IM may be administered. Um, let's see, okay, additional doses of uh, maximum total, 10 milligrams require medical consultation by all providers. So what are you going to do? You call the hospital, say, look, I gave the five, I'm going to give another five because the first five didn't work. And the doc says, sure, and you give the other five. IV slow, otherwise in the arm. If patient seizures are refractory to treatment, consider IO administration of midazolam. The midazolam is not available. Remember there was a shortage of midazolam some months ago or years ago, and so anyway, if that's the case, you're going to use diazepam and just look up the dose. Okay, but remember, diazepam, you can give it IV push, um, but it's not, it doesn't work that great IM. In other words, it's not designed for that. So if you're going to go IM, you can't get an IV, you're going to call the hospital and say, hey, doc, can I give it IM? If you got the Versed, it's really all you need. Diazepam's your backup in case, for some reason, you don't have the Versed. Okay? N next, let's go to the next page. So that's page one of your protocol. Next. Um, good. Now, we're going to move on. Patient is uh, pregnant, use midazolam followed by magnesium sulfate. Okay, in other words, if you're seizing, you're going to stick the midazolam. You're going to make sure, again, they're circling okay. Remember, in uterine displacement, make sure the uterus is pushed to the side, you know, if you have to. But then, if they're still seizing, you're going to worry about eclampsia. And it's a time you're going to give magnesium to in addition to the, to the, to the uh, midazolam. We mentioned it. We're just going to bring it up. And you're going to go ahead and... Um, if following administration of magnesium, patient exhibits signs of toxicity, consider calcium. We talked about that. If they're a little weak, you're going to give calcium. All right. Any questions? Midazolam in the arm? If they're a pregnant lady, midazolam and magnesium. IV. Okay. If you don't have the midazolam, you can use Valium, but then look up the dose. IV. And if you want to give an IM, talk to the medics. They may, in emergencies, they might have you do an IM. All right. But the jury's out on that. How easy. Now let's talk about kids, same principle. The problem is you've got to adjust the dose. One-year-olds weigh 10, five-year-olds weigh 20, three-year-olds weigh 15. I can do this. So what do you do? Your BLS, just like we saw before. If there's a known diabetic, you give the kids some glucose. Uh, and now we get to the ALS. Paramedic may assist patients with administration of their prescribed benzodiazepine. Notice that. You are totally okay, according to protocol, helping a mom give their usual prescribed value, which we just talked about, that benzodiazepine in their butt. Next. And this is the last page. Remember, there's three that you, we really need to go through word by word because this is your protocol, right? You need to know this. Altered mental status, seizures continue. Consider midazolam for seizures lasting greater than 10 minutes, okay? Protocol here is 10 minutes. If patient has no IV or IO, 0.2 mg per kg, IN or IM. I think you're just going to go IM, maximum dose 5. Now, the question is where to give it. Remember, you're going to give it in the leg, for kids less than about eight, particularly babies, right? IM dose is in the muscle of the leg. And personages that you feel uncomfortable taking their pants off because they're that old, it goes in the arm. That's how I think about it. I think the cutoff age is eight. But, all right. but if an IV is already in place, administer 0.1 milligrams in two milligram increments up to a maximum dose of five milligrams. 
Okay? It's exactly what you said before. For the adults, you're just using less because they're kids. Okay? Um, if a patient is pregnant, give them ag. Establish IO. Administer fluid boluses when appropriate. Okay? And if a child is actively seizing, administer midazolam, IN or IM, and uh, reserve 10 for a life-threatening illness. And reserve? Oh, oh IO, probably. Five. Thank you. All right, you get it. This is what we said. And then, uh, and why don't you use IO? First of all, it's pretty violent because the IM works just as good. And also, those little IO things are 500 bucks each. I read, read 500. I learned that yesterday at Washington Hospital or, the, or at uh, Children's. Or 500 bucks. One IM needle. Maybe you guys got it cheaper, but that's how much they pay at Children's for. Okay, additional doses of, uh, up to a maximum of, 10, of 5 milligrams require medical consultation. In other words, if 5 isn't working, you want to go higher, you just ask the doc in the ER, and, hey, the kid still sees, I want to give more while I transport, and they let you give more. I N, I M, they got the IV, you go IV. Simple. All right, and then they comment on midazolam is not available, consider diazepam. Just like for adults, for seizures lasting greater than 10 minutes, paramedic may perform without consult for patients with active seizures. Uh, up to 0.2 milligrams per kilo rectal, maximum dose 10 milligrams. 0.1 milligrams per kilo and 2.5 milligram increments, slow IV push for IM. IM requires, again, medical consultation. So if you don't have the Versed, you can oversimplify. You're always going to use the Versed, but if you happen to have to use the Valium because you don't have the Versed and you want it, you don't get an IV, you call the doc and they say, okay, let's try it, IM. All right, and, or you can put the IO in. Uh, use your judgment. A suspected nerve agent exposure, providers may administer midazolam as above or diazepam without medical consultation. In other words, if you think there's a nerve agent, that'd be pretty weird you can do that. This is the word for word what the protocol says, and this is the, your guidelines for the out-of-hospital management of someone with status epilepticus, and these are the treatments you have. You're checking a glucose. You may have to give glucose, right? You're going to give thymine with the glucose. And you can put IM, midazolam. If you get an IV, use IV midazolam. And by the way, it's a little more complicated if you have to add the if if you have to get the diazepam or Valium out, and you can call for help or look carefully if you have to give that. How easy is that? Next. And here's a summary of that. Okay, midazolam, diazepam, and magnesium. Really, it's magnesium and midazolam. Next. All right. And just a reminder. Deltoid, outside the baby's leg, kind of right out here. You hold the baby, put it in the leg. How many of you guys have given IM in a baby? A few people, not many. Okay. All right, right. And then how many people have done an adult in the arm? More? Okay. But, but now you know. Don't be afraid. It's, it's pretty straightforward. It's really hard to hurt the kid with the midazolam. Next. Um, you guys look like you're getting weary. So let's go ahead and keep going. Um, go. Oh, I, this is an important one. All right. So I want to watch, if you could just bear with me just a minute or two more, because I know you have to go home to your kids. I want you to watch one more video, because I think this one's very telling. All right. Take a look at this guy. If you have kids. If not, you're going to your parents. <laughs> <All right. laughs> All right. Now this is kind of a really fun. Oh, hello. I'm gonna first question because I've been reading up on Pokemon stuff right now, so I just play a lot. So I got the bands, seizures, and nutrition. Okay. And I'm gonna do a
<laughs> All right, that's enough, right? Okay, you get the idea. How many people think that's a seizure, right? Right. right. It's not, right? I, again. That's a pseudo seizure, right? And he's putting this on. It's not a real seizure, right? So, but look at all the things that suggest, but it may be real to him. It's like he, if he, he could probably pass a lie detector, I mean, but it's not real, right? There, there, so there's a lot, a lot, a lot of spells that aren't real, you know? But that could be pretty alarming if you didn't know better. Can you go to the next, can move on just a little bit? Let's see what's next. Next slide, toddler. Okay, keep going. Okay, I want to show you one more seizure. Okay, one more spell. And in and, and this, so take a look, and I want you to tell me if this is real or not. Okay, I'm telling you, I'm just going to tell you, right, this is not a real seizure, okay? But let's just take a look at it for a minute, because that last one was clearly not real. But let's take a look at this one. Very high frequency, but still tough, isn't it? He's good, isn't he? It's called obstetonus, and it's very rare for a seizure to get arching in the back. But if you're his mom, you'd be alarmed, right? Non-epileptic seizure. Okay, let's move on from that. But that's, that's a little, the first one was very obvious, right? This one's a little tougher, isn't it? Sometimes it's not so easy, you know, and so you really can look every breathing circulation. I check this kid's glucose to make sure I'm not missing anything. Has he had anything before? You may even have to transport this kid just to make absolutely sure. But you're, because you can't, you, unless you video, you're not going to see it, you know, but if you do, you see that, you're like, ooh. Um, all right, next. Keep going. Keep going. Keep going. Okay, that's our drugs. Keep going. Okay. By the way, that's Dr. Sagal and I. Um, this is that we get, the only time I ever get to drive anything is this QRV9. It's our, it's our QRV. At the, I work as a medic at Burning Man, which is this uh, big party in the Black Rock Desert, the Saturday, uh, probably the Labor Day weekend, the week before. And it's the only time I really get to work as a paramedic, you know, even though it's just a BLS unit, but it's still really fun. We drive this thing around it. And that's uh, Dr. Sagal there on the right with his gas mask. And that's my, it's so dusty we wear these masks all the time. It's amazing. It's like, a, it's like something out of Rambo. All right. So what have we said today? We said, first of all, I suggest the first thing you do when you see someone have a seizure is take your own pulse. The overwhelmingly, they're going to get better on their own much of the time. Think airway, breathing, circulation. You know this. You can imagine... Are we moving air? Is the brain getting oxygen? Is it, is it, is it, are we stable with our blood pressure? Right? Then neurologic, we think, okay, why would this person see? <coughs> Most common in a kid is a fever. All of a sudden they get a fever. They have a ear infection. Up it goes. Little kids. Less than two or three. This is relatively common. Again, it won't last that long. A minute. We saw all that first baby. How long that lasts? Not that long. There we circulation. Monitors. You put them on monitors now when you show up. What are you going to do next? Again, air being the circulation, and then you're going to do your disability, check a glucose, and you expose them, right? Check a temperature. It might be 104. Oh, my goodness. Kid's cold. There's a wise tale that you can put your kid in the faucet and cool them down, even though it doesn't do that much, but it makes you feel good. Right? Then you do your ample history, allergies, medicines, past medical history, last meal and event. Then you'll decide, do you need a transport? If indeed the seizure lasts more than five minutes, you know that you have a problem. Well, meanwhile, you're, then you're going to treat it. And you get your trusty midazolam, which you mind's eye, you can even do tonight when you go home. Imagine, how am I going to give midazolam to somebody, a baby and an adult? How am I going to draw it up? And how am I going to give it? So simple. And if they're pregnant, oh, I'm going to put an IV and give some magnesium. I can do that. Then, while I'm transporting, okay, I can think, what else? Is the brain perfusing? Is there enough flow? Does it have enough oxygen? Is there a structural problem in there that's causing a short circuit? 
tumor, stroke, old people in particular, stroke, right? Uh, remember the syncope. Remember I told you about that. Someone has a heart attack and they're sitting up. They're not perfusing their head. They might have some seizure, right? Uh, and then what are we going to do? Uh, the next thing, of course, is we're going to look at drugs. Do we need to give thymine and uh, some glucose, you know, um, uh, but alcohol withdrawal? Again, the midazolam will help with that too, right? And then electrolyte abnormalities. Uh, they have had an ecstasy. The kid, the seven, 18-year-old is, or 20-year-old's been out and done a lot of ecstasy, and now they have hyponatremia, and they're seizing because their electrolytes aren't right. For our purposes, though, by then you're going to be in the emergency department. They can check that. In the interim, you stop the seizure with the midazolam. If it doesn't work, you call the hospital. Guess what? He's still breathing. Vital signs are okay, but he's still seizing. Can I give more? Sure, give more. And guess what? If you give too much, what happens? They stop breathing, and then you bag them. How hard is that? You can do that. That's BLS. <laughs> then you bring them in bagging them. I gave too much medicine, but I stopped their seizure. I saved their life. Congratulations. <laughs> right? <laughs> yes. And then the, then the hospital is going to take care of everything else. Good job. He packages them nicely. How simple is that? Thank you for the invitation to come up from uh, D.C. Um, to t share with you some things that I think about uh, when we think of the prior to hospital management of seizures.